This podcast is brought to you by Savage Arms. They just introduced their first straight pull rifle, the Impulse. Straight pull is a pretty cool deal. It's a little bit different than a conventional bolt gun where the bolt, instead of going up and then back, you just straight pull it back to the rear, push it forward. So it's super fast. It's popular a lot of places around the world, but the fact that Savage is doing it is pretty cool. And it also includes their AccuStock, their AccuFit, their AccuTrigger. So a lot of those features on Savage guns that you've come to know and love. Um, it's available in a big game version, a predator version, and a hog hunter version. So check it out. New gun from Savage, savagearms.com. It's the Savage Arms Impulse. Also, this podcast is brought to you by Gun Dealio, gundealio.com and the smartphone app, Gun Dealio. Download the smartphone app, free for your phone. You'll get notifications about deals on guns, ammo, and then also podcast stuff, video stuff. So a lot of good content there, but also deals to be had. And also we can send you messages when you walk into a gun store, give you a heads up about new products or deals going on. And then gundelio.com, it's kind of the sister site for it. And uh, another place where you can find ammo in stock and deals galore. So check that out. All right, welcome to Gun Talk Nation. Today on Gun Talk Nation, we've got a guy who shoots a lot of guns, competitive shooter um, of one of the biggest gun companies out there, but he's got a new project that we want to talk about. Uh, welcome in, Shane Coley, man. Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah, thanks for being here. So, um, Shane, Team Glock, a competitive shooter, but let's just jump in. What's the new project? Well, you know, lately I've been working with, um, with Timney Triggers on a new competition trigger that I think is going to completely break the market. I mean, we've been, we've been working on this thing now for the uh, last three or four months, and it is something that I am genuinely excited about, and I can't wait for everyone else to see what it is that we are actually, or what it is that we've actually built. So this is a big deal. I know for me, we've, we've worked with Timney over the years, and Timney is, I mean, a 75-year-old trigger company. They're kind of the in my mind, the granddaddy of trigger companies and have always been long guns. And I think, is this the first pistol trigger that they've done? This will be their first, their first aftermarket or first trigger they've ever done for a pistol. So this is for Glocks. For Glocks. Okay. And people go, okay, oh my gosh, I have so many questions. Um, so which Glock is it for? Uh, so the, the initial launch on January 20th is going to be for the Gen 3, Gen 4s. And then six weeks later, March 1st, we're going to have everything come out for the Gen 5. Okay. So it'll be for all <laughs> 17, 19, uh, 34, um, and then we'll have it for uh, the competition models as well. So this is a, um, and correct me if I'm, I'm not right on this, but this is a trigger from Timmy for Glocks that works in... Most Glocks. Most Glocks, yes. Yeah. Just a drop-in trigger. It's not, you don't have to buy the night Gen 9, you know, the G19, the G17, G34. It, that one trigger works for all of these. Yes, correct. That's crazy. So, um, so people are going to say, okay, why do that? And I guess maybe we jump into, um, gosh, how important is a good trigger for you as a competition shooter and what difference can it make for just a regular shooter? Well, as a, as a competition shooter, I mean, I'm always looking for every advantage I can find and having an awesome trigger. That's got an incredible break that is completely reliable and also has a positive reset or things that I look for every day in a trigger. And, you know, over the years I've built, I've built a handful of different triggers that I felt like have been, that have been very promising. They've done well. They've, they've worked well. They've been consistent. They've been reliable. And then Timney introduced this. They sent me the first prototype mm -hmm. and it blew all of those out of the water. <laughs> so always looking for that next advantage is I think critical for, you know, any competition shooter because having a great trigger is, is it, it's, it's incredible to have on the range because it just, it makes breaking that shot so much easier. Yeah. You know, when you have uh, a five pound trigger versus a two and a half or a three pound trigger, you know, the math is in your favor for the lighter trigger. And like right. I said, as a competition shooter, I'm always looking for that slight advantage I can have over a competitor. Fair to say. So in that example, a five pound trigger, I mean, we all know that trigger control is everything, especially on pistols. 
um, you have a short sight radius. If you're having to apply five pounds of pressure on a gun that weighs two or three pounds or whatever it is, um, now you're really able to influence the gun um, even more right. versus maybe a little bit lighter trigger. Is that right? Yeah, and, and anytime it? you have anytime you have a heavier trigger, I mean, you know, the, the force to pull the trigger to the rear is always going to be more, and any slight deviation in that, you know, that rearward rearward press is or could possibly deviate the sights off the target. And in a competition world, that makes a big difference. You know, that that slight deviation in the trigger pull could be go from an alpha shot on a target to a complete miss, depending on the distance of the target. Oh yeah. And now we have a trigger that's lighter, more advantageous for competition. So it makes that trigger pull easier for, for myself and for your average competitor. So triggers are funny to me because I think that they're very personal. So somebody will say, I like this trigger or I don't like that trigger. And we have so many variations. You've got, uh, you've got curved, you've got flat, you've got all these different, you've got how heavy is it? What's the take up? Uh, what's the length of it? You know, what's the reset? How do you explain what you like? Cause you've worked with Timney on this to go, okay, this is what I'm looking for, but it's kind of like saying, you know, we, we do production and it's like, um, what type of music do you want on your radio commercial? And how do you even start, you know, like, uh, something good. I don't know. <laughs> I right? Good music. I guess. Right. But how do you explain what you're looking for in a trigger? Uh, immediately. First thing I look for is obviously reliability, you know, <clears throat> working with Glock and being a part of this brand reliability is first and foremost for us. And so reliability has to come first when it comes to any, anything I do for my competition guns. Um, and then the break and the positive reset are my number two and three after that. You know, I, I want to have, I want to have a clean, consistent break. I like having a little bit of prep in my trigger just for, you know, the harder shots, the shots, the shots at distance. You're so harder. sort of a, sort of a take up. Yes. Just a little okay. bit of take up where I can feel the wall and then mm -hmm. I can, you know, prep for that shot, prep for the target. Um, and then when you come into the close shots or the fast shots, you start running your, you know, your quick splits, your build drills or et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I want to have that positive reset. So I know the trigger is not hanging up during reset. And I know that every time that my finger comes off the trigger to shoot my next shot, that the trigger is ready for me to shoot again. Right. So I'm looking for the reliability, the crisp break, the little bit of prep and the absolute positive reset. So do you think that that is, does that, would that translate for the hobbyist shooter. I mean, you're a pro, you, you kind of have what you'd like, but does that translate for, for most of us who are like, okay, I'm not, I'm not, you know, captain of team Glock or anything, but what do I need? I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I think this, I think this absolutely will translate over to, you know, your everyday shooter, your, your, your weekend shooter or the average competitor that wants to, to get into sports shooting or the guy that's already been competing for five, six years. Um, you know, this trigger has, I think it's opened up a new door for reliability and for um, how well the trigger breaks itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's such a clean and consistent break that it's advantageous to everybody. You know, it, it, I think it's, I think it's going to fit in the market with everyone who wants a more advantageous trigger for any realm of competition shooting. So what are some of the specs? I mean, you know, what's the pull and what's the, you know, is it flat? Explain, you know, just describe it for, for those of us listening, for those listening. So the trigger face itself or the trigger shoe itself is somewhat flat. It's got a slight curve to it. Um, the trigger pull out of the box, standard drop into the pistol is three pounds and it comes with three parts. It is a complete drop in trigger and it uses all stock parts. Oh, wow. You don't have to change any firing pin, firing pin spring, uh, fire pin safety, fire pin safety spring. You don't have to change any of those parts. Um, the only thing that comes out is the trigger bar and the trigger spring. And we have a receiver that goes into the trigger housing. You put the new trigger bar in, put the return spring in, and you are good to go. So you've been messing with it. How long does it take you to, to change one out? I changed one on the range with two tools. I have my Glock tool and a uh, very small flathead screwdriver, which mm -hmm. is not completely necessary. It just helps with the process a little bit. Mm -hmm. But on the range, it took me, I think, right around two minutes and 20 seconds. Really? So it's super easy to install. It's not 
there's not a lot of moving parts. It's just, it's three pieces. And, and I think number one, that's something that I know Timney strives for. Just, they want that to be as drop in as possible. Right. They want the install to be as easy as possible. I mean, anybody listening to this is that's always one of the concerns is like, okay, how involved is this? I'm not a gunsmith. Um, and then the other part would to me, and you kept talking about reliability is the fewer parts and things that you have to mess with. I mean, the better, I think there's, there's <laughs> speaking from a guy who's not a gunsmith, never would, will play one on TV. Um, the fewer parts, the better, like less, right. less chances for me to mess it up. Right. Well, <laughs> along with the reliability comes the simplicity of it. Mm-hmm. You know, with only, with only three parts, I mean, like I said, it took me two minutes on the range to put this trigger in the gun. And I, I am also of no gunsmith. I've never, never been a gunsmith. Right. Um, but the, the simplicity of the system itself and how easy it is to install to get the results that we've gotten, I, I think is pretty incredible. Yeah. Well, and obviously there's a funny thing with aftermarket stuff to me. Um, Cause I've never been up until recently an aftermarket guy. I'm like Mr. Stock guy, buy my car, drive it, buy a gun, shoot it. Um, but maybe five, six years ago, I started messing with aftermarket stuff on guns, on uh, stereos and all that stuff. And it's always better. <laughs> Typically when you upgrade and I, it is an upgrade when you, when you uh, do that. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with a Glock trigger. I mean, they're good, right. but um, you go, Ooh, but I like this. Or it's just, a, maybe it's just a matter of customizing right. to go, Hey, I like this better. Well, I think with, uh, with that, I think everybody has their own, their own personal taste and their own personal preference and what, mm-hmm. you know, what they like in, 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 in their pistols. And, you know, the, the, the gun that Glock builds is it's built for a purpose and it, it excels phenomenally at that purpose. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Glock is always going to make an incredible handgun. It's always going to make the most reliable handgun on the market. But from a competition standpoint, I'm looking for every advantage I can find. And when we have something as simple as this, and I can just drop it into my pistol, mm-hmm. it's an advantage for me. Yeah. And the consistency that we have um, and the reliability that we have with the trigger, it's it's all a, it's all a win-win. Yeah. So, um, so what gun are you shooting in competition right now? Right now, because I compete in limited division, we have a division requirement of the smallest caliber I can use is 40 cal. So I compete with a Glock 24. Okay. I like the longer slide radius or the longer sight radius. Uh, with the longer slide, I've got a little bit more mass in the slide. So yeah. to me, uh, I feel like it reduces a little bit of the felt recoil. But that's what I've been competing with for the last five or six years. And uh, what have you done to that gun? Really, uh, I've changed the sights on it. I have a Dawson fiber optic front sight. Mm-hmm. I have a Ken sight adjustable rear milled into the rear of the slide. Okay. Uh, Agency Arms does uh, my slide work and. Really, all they do is they engrave my name on the side of the slide, and and then they they cut my front serrations and stipple my grip, and then now this trigger. Yeah. So my guns are pretty much minimally customized. You know, I'm uh, it's just the bare minimum of what I would think uh, a customization could be for the Glock. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I love it. It's I, I found I found a system for me that works. It works consistently. It works reliably. And it's what I love to go out and compete with. All right. You mentioned stippling the grip, Mm -hmm. which is a fun subject that we've covered a little bit here and there. Uh, KJ decided he wanted to try to ruin one of his Glocks. Um, So he kind of, you know, you've ever seen Groundhog Day where they hit don't drive angry, never stipple angry, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. but uh, a rather aggressive texture. (laughs) If you like, you know, uh, 80 grit sandpaper, yes. that kind of idea. I've been there before. Um, so st- stippling the grip, um, again, it's one of those things that th- I've, I find that over the years I've, I've changed my mind on some of this stuff. It's like, there's nothing wrong with this. But then when you have, I kind of like a little bit more aggressive texture. Right. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Well, I mean, for me as a competitor, you know, if I'm out competing and it's, 8,000 degrees outside and I'm sweating mm-hmm. like crazy. Yep. I really, really want an aggressive texture on my gun because it just, it keeps my hand from sliding around. And, um, so I have probably a medium to more aggressive texture on my, on my grip stipple. Um, 
and it may not be for everyone. Some people like the less aggressive. Some people like the 80 grit sandpaper, right. which is fine. <laughs> uh, but I, I, you know, I find myself kind of in the middle, but uh, I, I think, I think it's another thing that's advantageous. I mean, it's, it just allows my hand to have a more consistent placement through all weather conditions. Are there certain places on the gun where you like to add stippling? Uh, mostly on the front strap of the pistol. Cause I feel like that's kind of where my fingers slide around the most, okay. especially in manipulation with, with reloads, right. uh, draws themselves. Um, and then just other manipulations and stuff, I think around the front strap of the gun. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, you, you see all varieties of it and mm-hmm. some people go, well, if I'm going to stipple, I'm going to stipple this whole darn thing. Oh yeah. And go crazy with oh, it. Oh, trust me. I've seen the, the glory days of stippling. <laughs> um, and I think, you actually have people now who are doing it and doing a really nice job and they're kind of a, a small operation in a garage, but they're really artists. Right. I mean, we, the guy, uh, Stip Grips is, is doing a bunch of that stuff. Yeah. Um, we, we send him some stuff from time to time. Um, yeah. Agency's done. They, they've been building my guns now for, I think since I've been at Glock and they do a phenomenal stipple job. Yeah. All right. So you mentioned 40 Cal mm-hmm. and uh, it's funny because this past year we, we, when we, with ammo being what it's been and, and hard to come by, we were joking at the beginning that like, maybe this is the time to whip out your 40 cal gun that you weren't shooting much. Cause maybe you can find ammo. And you know, by the end of 2020, you couldn't find ammo for anything, I guess. Right. Um, everybody has, has kind of, well, I shouldn't say everybody that's too broad, but a lot of people have just gone nine and they don't think about it. But when someone's saying 40 versus nine and all this stuff and you shoot 40 all the time, I mean, what's your take on it? I love 40. Yeah. I mean, I know it's, uh, it's around that I feel like has probably had its fame and the fame has kind of passed, mm-hmm. but I don't mind 40. I mean, the rounds I'm shooting now are, are super soft. Um, they probably feel similar to some of the nine mil rounds that I shoot. Uh, but I have no issue with 40. I think it's a good round. I mean, and especially in today's age, I think people now are just happy to find anything. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. I mean, there's that. And and I'm a little bit of a ballistic nerd. Yeah. And so I'll get into the ballistics of all this stuff, knowing all well that it probably doesn't matter as much as shot placement for for me as a, like as, as a carry gun type of situation. But 40 is kind of the sweet spot when you think about, OK, the energy you're getting, the weight of the bullet. Um, usually maybe you lose like one round in the gun compared to a nine, depending on the gun. I think, yeah, two, I think for my guns, I get like 22 rounds with my nine mil mags and then, uh, I think 19 or 20 with my forties. So yeah, not a huge difference. Yeah. The feeling of shooting it is a little bit different. Sure. I mean, unless you're, you're customizing the load, but if you're shooting just out of the box, 40 versus nine, the the 40 tends to be a little snappier. Right. Right. Uh, What's the strategy for you as far as controlling recoil and all that stuff. That's always one of the, the foundations as a, as a competitive shooter. Well, I think a lot of recoil management comes from your grip and, you know, I don't, t- I don't particularly like the, um, the push pull method that's been around for ages. Um, I have kind of like a, it's I'm trying to think of the verbiage, um, more like a torque grip method where I p- apply all the pressure to the top of the grip. Okay. And, uh, I think that helps me really manage the recoil, especially like you said, the 40 is a little bit snappier. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I feel like that helps me manage the recoil a little bit more consistently and also gives me uh, consistent sights coming back onto the target. Mm-hmm. So I think having that torque method to the top of the frame applies pressure in the appropriate spot where the pivot point is of the pistol. So torquing it down as far as like maybe using your shoulders and your elbows, kind of turning your hands in. Yeah. It's like, think of a, uh, think of a horseshoe. You have both ends pointing straight up and you're trying to make those both of or make both of those ends touch each other. Gotcha. So you're taking just the top ends of the court of the horseshoe and just trying to bend them into each other. I would think that doing that as opposed to just gripping the gun as hard as you can, um, would let your trigger finger operate a little bit more freely. It does. It does. I mean, we have, we have people on the range that have the absolute death grip on the gun (laughs) where, you know, it just kind of shuts everything off. But this grip, it's it's a very firm grip. You don't have to squeeze the life out of the pistol. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm absolutely a firm believer in a, in, a, in, a, in a firm grip. Yeah. But I'm also not death gripping the gun to where the gun no longer can breathe. Right. So uh, this this does free up my trigger finger a lot. It allows me to have consistent shots on target, consistent trigger pulls. And I just feel like it manages recoil to the 
to my best ability. Well, I, I think shooting, shooting a gun and especially a pistol, um, there are many ways to do it. It's kind of like a, you know, a golf swing. There's a lot of weird golf swings out there and what, whatever works for you works for you. I mean, if you ever watched Lee Trevino or Chi Chi Rodriguez back in the day, I'm dating myself, but, um, but they had some weird, ass, like you would never teach someone to do yeah. that. We'll and look I mean, at a uh, Matt Wolf currently. Yeah. Crazy golf swing, but it works. Right. Right. I like, uh, and then you can't really argue with Rob Latham. He's had a pretty good run, Yeah, but you know, you ask Rob about grip and he's like, well, with my right hand, I like to give it a hundred percent, you know, as much as I can grip it. And with my left hand, I also like to give it a hundred percent. I just, and he, you know, he kind of like, yeah, I kind of just grip it as hard as you can. Yeah. But, know, I, but then I guess if your if your trigger finger's not working, maybe, okay, back off 10% or right, something right. like that. You know, I've always told people, uh, you know, when we talk like fundamentals, when we talk grip, stance, trigger control, et cetera, uh, probably 90% of what we say is probably the standard for the fundamentals. And then you have the other 10% that makes you, you. Right. So you have that 10% that makes, you know, that makes me Shane. You have for a guy like Rob, he has that 10% that makes him Rob mm -hmm. and that's okay. You know, if you change something about a portion of the fundamentals that works for you and it works, how can I say that you're wrong? Mm -hmm. So I think everybody has that, whether it be 10, 15, whatever percent that, is their own style, their own little flair to the fundamentals. And I think that's completely okay. I'm seeing that also in shooting schools, um, you know, gunfighting schools, and also even like rifle long range schools and stuff where I, th I think maybe a decade or two ago, it used to be, a, here is the way. Right. And now it's, here is a way. Right, right. And, you know, try it and adjust it for you, right? Because different body types and, and all that stuff, like you're saying. Right, well, with... With everything, there's always opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. And if we ever say, you know, this is how we've always done it and here's how we're going to do it, I feel like that's the moment we stop learning. Mm -hmm. So as long as there's opportunity for growth, which I always believe there is, then there might be a 90% standard of here's what's right. But there's also going to be a percentage that, but you can also do it this way if this works better for you. Right. If this makes you feel more comfortable behind the pistol, makes you excel at this drill, makes you, you know, uh, more capable than I still think you're right. Right. How, how can you argue with it? Right. Yeah. I think it's funny. I think competitive shooters and also along those lines, and you've worked with them, um, the really elite, uh, military guys, um, they are not caught up in dogma. If it works, it works. Right. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday with someone about Tommy guns in World War II. And Tommy guns uh, were being made back in the 20s and 30s. And then we got into World War II. And what uh, sometimes the, the U.S. military, but especially British military, were doing, it's like, well, the way where the sling swivels are, it makes the gun flip upside down for me if I'm holding it on my shoulder. And they just un unscrew it and put it onto the top of the gun right. or, or this thing rattles too much when I'm trying to be sneaky, you know, they just rip it out. And I think, I mean, have you seen that as well with like some of these special ops guys? It's like, look, I don't care. You want to get into a debate about isosceles and Weaver and all this right. stuff. If you can shoot fast and hit your target. Cool. Let's right. do that. Well, you know, for guys like that, for some of your top tier units, what I've seen is they bring in so many different instructors because they want to learn everything they can. And then they build their own platforms that work for them. Yeah. Like you said, if you, if you were to take a me, a JJ Rakaza, Max Michelle, a Dan Horner and put us all in the range together, not a single one of us would shoot the exact same. Right. We would all have our own flair, but our own flair works for us. Mm -hmm. And then you have these other guys that bring, you know, the professional shooters in and they learn, you know, what I teach plus my little flair. They right. learn what Dan teaches plus his little flair. And then that might work for some of those guys. And then what I teach might work for the rest of them or vice versa. But they all take, they all take what they want from it and they apply it to their capabilities and make it work for them. And yeah. that is still okay. Well, and, and along those lines, you think about, we're talking about top tier military units, bringing in this variety of trainers and, and uh, pro shooters as well as tactical folks. Um, what's the value for, a regular person taking a class versus just going to the range and, and, you know, making one's fired brass. Yeah. Well, the, the, the value of any class is being able to expedite the process of 
I guess some of the, the, the skills needed, you know, and if I've been doing this whole competitive shooting thing for like 17 years now, mm -hmm. you know, someone could take a class from me and probably expedite five or six of those years of mistakes and stupid things that I thought were cool at the time and just dumb stuff that I did. Mm -hmm. And I would say, Hey, I tried this once. Don't do it. Right. It does not work at all. But you know, the value of a the class there is you get to learn so much from so many different capable people that you just expedite that process, you know, whether it be fundamentals or in a, from a competitive standpoint, you know, how we, how we game stages or how we move throughout a course, you know, JJ and I, we completely move differently, but we accomplish the same thing. So if they take a class from me or take a class from JJ, they might take 50% of him and 50% of me sure. put it together. And then now they have their shooting style that benefits them the most. What works for them. Right. So it just, I feel like it just expedites that learning process and allows them more tools to, to make themselves better shooters. It was funny. My, my wife has taken several pistol classes and she's not a competitive shooter. This is more on the defensive side of things, but probably about once a year, she'll organize a, a all women's uh, pistol class for the mm -hmm. day, a defensive pistol. And she's done it several times. And recently, a couple of months ago, she did another one. And going into it, she goes, you know, I've done this same class. I wonder if I should do something else or if I'm, am I going to get anything from this? And she gets home that day. She's like, oh my gosh, we had a new instructor and he told me things that the other guy hadn't told me. And I, right. I got so much out of it. Even if it was the same, you know, one day defensive pistol class. Right, right. Well, you know, you go to a class and you have, you know, have you know, X, X instructor says this curriculum and that's great. And then you go to a new class and like I said, 95% of the curriculum is the exact same, but that 5% is what someone might latch onto mm -hmm. as being completely new information. It might help them overcome a plateau they've been struggling with. And it's just something that neither one of the instructors are wrong. It's just they have their own little style, their own little flair that might help one shooter in a different way than it does another shooter. And yeah. both of those are right. And yeah. I think that's a lot of what people misunderstand is, you know, when instructors get to teaching that this is the way. Right. And it's not, yes, it's the way, but it's not the only way. Yeah, I, th I think I, I, if I run into s someone who says, well, this is the way you have to do it. Or, oh boy, a lot of times online, this is the way you have to do oh, it. Online is dangerous and, place. And let's not wade into that murky place. But I always think they probably took one class yeah. that was great. It was worthwhile, but they had this one experience and that's become the Bible for them. Right. Versus, well, you, you take a bunch of classes from a bunch of different people and you go, oh, okay, there's some different ways to do this. And maybe I figure out what works for me. Right. Well, all of us have our own experiences. So there might be things that another instructor has experienced that I have not. And he can speak on those experiences because I've never done it before. Yeah. So there's different, there's different scenarios in all of this. And if you only take one class, you only get one, one source of information and we can always expand our knowledge base. So being able to take classes from so many different people, uh, it just it just helps expand that knowledge base so that you're able to pull information from so many different resources and basically build your own shooting package that benefits you the most. So going full circle here, I mean, probably the majority of people listening to this um, probably have a Glock. I mean, it's safe to say that everybody seems to have like one Glock. And if you don't, you're probably like, thinking, like that. you know, uh, uh, maybe I should get one. Um, so this this Timney trigger is initially for the majority of Glocks out there. Right. Um, give them the rundown of like, um, what's it called? When's it going to be out? All that stuff. It's called the Timney uh, Glock Alpha Competition Trigger. It's okay. going to be out January 20th for Gen 3 and Gen 4 models. And then March 1st for Gen 5s. Uh, like I said, it's a three piece system completely drop in uses all the stock parts. You just change out the parts that come in the package and it takes about two to three minutes to install and that's it. And you're ready to go shoot. That's awesome. All right. Easy to install. We like that. I like that. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, upgrading your trigger will make a difference. Yep. Hit Looking. alphas instead of not alphas. Oh, man, I love shooting alphas. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, thanks for being with us, man. Thanks, man. I always enjoy the show. That's it for us. We'll see you next time. Gun Talk Nation.